was asked to comment on the Holocaust. Uh, people showed up for music class. Uh, Keely, what would Keely and the Holocaust students need to do the Holocaust? Yeah, it is. Which one is the She said it was dicey, but I think that's the kind of thing she would give her. She was here. Yeah. So, 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 so,
So let's start by defining what digital humanities is and then ask what role should DH play in an urban public university like the University of Illinois Chicago. As the title of my colleague Matt Gold's um, recent hefty collection, Debates in the Digital Humanities, suggests, people who self-define as DHers have trouble even agreeing among themselves on a definition of the digital humanities, why they do it, and what it takes to be considered a member of the hardy DH band. DHers spend an awful lot of time arguing, debating, uh, and debating what constitutes DH and what it means to practice DH. The University of Maryland's Matt Kirschenbaum is as good a person to start with as any to define what DH is. He posed the following rhetorical question, what is DH and what is it doing in English departments in the title of a 2010 essay that Matt Gold reprinted to kick off his debates collection? book that I'd recommend your DH working group read and discuss. It's full of a lot of interesting things and, and discussions and arguments. In the essay, Kirschenbaum looks back in time for an answer to the two questions posed in his title, back to the origins of the humanities computing and literary and linguistic computing movements. Those initiatives, some of them now more than a quarter century old, yielded important results notably the Text Encoding Initiative, TEI, established in 1989, which set the XML, which stands for the Extensible Markup Language Standard for marking up scholarly text for presentation on the web, as well as the original 2001 appearance of the Companion to Digital Humanities from Blackwell, a foundational text in DH in which the field took on its current DH identity, thanks to a suggestion from John Unsworth, of the University of Virginia of a name change from humanities computing to digital humanities that ultimately and decisively stuck. One reason that Kirschenbaum could pose the question about English departments in the second part of his title is that so many early DH projects were focused on building digital scholarly editions of canonical literary works and their key texts, the Whitman, Blake, and Rossetti archives and the Nines Initiative which stands for Networked Infrastructure for 19th Century Electronic Scholarship, all launched in the 1990s, are key examples. Each of these projects was connected directly or indirectly with English programs at their home campuses, and each took full advantage of TEI and the subsequent development of other software applications to build their digital scholarly editions and archives. The world of textual scholarship and analysis, at least the way such scholarly analysis was done, inside of English departments had been fundamentally transformed. While English has been the dominant academic discipline that helped drive the DH bandwagon, other academic disciplines, some squarely in the humanities, others outside of that disciplinary framework, have also played important roles in DH's, DH's development over the past decade. I would argue that when we define the humanities part of the digital humanities, we should think not only of the traditional humanities disciplines, for example, English, philosophy, languages, classics, etc., but also extend the definition by embracing the one used by the Mellon Foundation in its funding initiatives in the humanities. They say, quote, humanities is broadly understood to include the arts, history, languages, area studies, and zones of such fields as anthropology and, ge and geography that bridge the humanities and social sciences, unquote. If we start from this broader definition of the humanities, then I think Loyola University of Chicago literary scholar and DH Steve Jones, the other Steve Jones um, in this context, has as good a functional definition of DH as we need. DH, according to Jones, is, quote, an umbrella term for a diverse set of practices and concerns, all of which combine computing and digital media with humanities research and teaching, unquote. My only addition to Steve Jones's concise definition would be to emphasize the collaborative and interdisciplinary nature of the work process and the academic output of many DH projects. The traditional academic trope, the lone scholar laboring in a disciplinarily siloed archive, has been disrupted by DH praxis, with its emphasis on interdisciplinary inquiry and collaboration by a diversely skilled 
uh, by diversely skilled members of project teams that end up producing and conceiving most DH projects. I will have more to say about DH's collaborative and interdisciplinary nature in a few moments, but I would say you have a wonderful example of such a DH project right here on this campus. It happens to be my daughter's own history bus, which I just saw, much to my amazement and delight, and would recommend it to you highly as an example of that kind of a project. So, excuse that, that's the familiar thing that the Briars can't help themselves about. So what exactly can DH do that traditional academic approaches to scholarly work have not or cannot do? Let me start to answer that question by looking at the um, Stanford literary scholar Franco Moretti's Graphs, Maps, Trees, Abstract Models for Literary History. Um, an especially thoughtful example of how DH scholarship can pose new research questions and develop new research methodologies to answer those questions. In his 2005 foundational DH text, Moretti argued that we can learn previously undiscovered things, what he calls emerging qualities, about the scope and nature of 18th and 19th century English prose fiction writing, his scholarly field, by employing what he calls distant reading techniques. Distant reading uses quantitative, spatial, and morphological data about the number, frequency, geographic spread, and genre and subgenre forms of the entire corpus of these British novels, which is about two to three hundred books that he's looking at. As compared to the typical close reading most literary scholars do of a small number of canonical works in that corpus, and he does this to draw broader conclusions about those works um, and the larger historical, cultural, and geographical context out of which not such novels emerge. If I had to use an instrument analogy to explain the concept of distant reading, I'd say its instrument of choice is a telescope rather than a microscope, which is what close reading is all about, metaphorically speaking. I won't try to summarize Moretti's larger conclusions in graphs, maps, and trees here. His analysis, which has strong historical materialist overtones, is too rich to nuance to do that easily, but I will suggest that his provocative, slim book, it's all of 90 pages, is a must read for all scholars, regardless of discipline, largely because Moretti challenges us to think interdisciplinarily and in, in, in fully interdisciplinarily, in, in interdisciplinary and entirely new ways about analytical questions and methodological approaches that we rarely consider in the academy, given our abiding commitment to siloed <laughs> disciplinary boundaries and our unyielding reliance on traditional research methodologies. Moretti's distant reading helps us understand that digital tools can create their own forms of inquiry and can yield new research questions that we never asked, let alone attempted to answer. Beyond making us rethink the very nature and forms of academic scholarship, as Moretti has done, DH has also managed to raise important questions about traditional forms of academic publication and double-blind peer review, the double-blind peer review process on which these publications are usually determined. Few can argue that the ways we have managed to publish most academic scholarship over the past century in print periodicals and journals and academic monographs published in small print runs, largely by university presses, can be sustained at anything close to previous levels. The economics of academic publishing, as well as evaporating university and public library budgets for new book and journal purchases, make it less and less likely that traditional print venues for scholarship can keep, keep up with the expanding volume of academic output that needs to be printed nor can it meet um, the professional needs of the current and, and future generations of scholars who must publish their work to secure jobs, get promoted, and ultimately secure tenure, assuming that now venerable in academic protection system manages to, provide, uh, to survive the rapid changes that are sweeping universities worldwide. DHers have participated broadly in rethinking both the form and the process of traditional academic production, pushing forward a number of open access, open source publications 
that make academic publishing accessible more quick, quickly in a variety of new digital formats, including digital journals, electronic books and blogs, aimed at, um, uh, at both academic and public audiences. I would name Kairos, um, the Journal of Rhetoric, Technology, and Pedagogy, Digital Humanities Now, uh, the Journal of Digital Humanities, and CUNY's own Journal of Interactive Technology and Pedagogy as but four examples of such new online open access journal publications. I'll have more to say about that <coughs> in a minute. As with online publication of scholarship, digital humanists have also helped create new forms of academic peer review that take advantage of digital tools to make the academic assessment process faster, more collaborative, and more transparent. Let me offer but one example. Kathleen Fitzpatrick's important book, Planned Obsolescence, Publishing Technology and the Future of the, Cat, uh, of the Academy, published in 2011, in which she makes a provocative argument that the Academy's very future depends on our willingness to embrace <coughs> new digital and collectively generated forms of peer review and academic publication. Fitzpatrick argues persuasively that only if the university can accomplish a dramatic move away from what she calls, quote, the production and dissemination of individual academic products to imagining a system focused more broadly on facilitating the processes of, of scholarly work, unquote, will we be able to rescue academic peer review and academic publishing from itself. Her book's publisher, NYU Press, put its money behind Fitzpatrick's words. Dozens of peer reviewers, myself included, read and commented on draft um, chapters collectively online using a special piece of horizontal blogging software called Comment Press developed by the Institute for the Future of the Book prior to planned obsolescence's simultaneous publication as a print and e-book. It should be noted that NYU Press also sent the book out for traditional external reviews as well. While these traditional outside reviews were useful, Patrick and, <coughs> Patrick and NYU Press both have credited the collaborative, open, online peer review process with demonstrably strengthening the final product. So what you can see here is the, the, the text is broken up into, um, obviously, chapters and sections, and each paragraph can be commented on separately um, by uh, uh, any outside reviewer, which is what happened here. Um, and so basically anybody can come in. This was a, a more select group of reviewers who were invited into comment, but she sort of generated 50 or 60 sets of comments at the paragraph level on her manuscript before she finalized it. And it was a very powerful and effective way for her to get that, that kind of feedback, and she was then able to engage with commenters and critics at, at the time as the book was being finalized and put together, rather than waiting a year or two for an academic review and then having the opportunity or not to respond um, to reviewers. Perhaps more important than the way Fitzpatrick's book was reviewed and published was her thoughtful and insightful analysis in its pages of what is wrong with the current state of academic publishing, peer reviewing, and academic assessment. Fitzpatrick argues that the supposed cloak of anonymity, intolerable delays in the review, revision, and publication processes, the potential for favoritism or self-serving decisions on the part of anonymous peer reviewers and journal and press editors, and most tellingly, the entirely opaque quality of the peer review process all have contributed to an increasingly dysfunctional peer review system for print journals and monographs that restricts rather than encourages new scholarly approaches and narrows the channels for academic publication rather than expands them. Like Moretti, Fitzpatrick writes as a member of the DH community, and also like Moretti, <coughs> she's provided a thoughtful, insightful, and transformative analysis that reimagines academic practices that we previously have thought of as immutable. This is a second DH book that I recommend that all faculty members and graduate students, as well as college administrators, read and more importantly talk about to help spur much needed conversations about how and why 
we need to change our academic um, assessment practices as a new generation of scholars, many of them immersed in and engaged by the digital humanities, move through the tenure and promotion processes. Digital humanities and the digital affordances upon which it is based also <coughs> offers possibilities for, for pursuing not only new approaches to, uh, to scholarly inquiry and to academic publishing and evo evaluation, but also a new set of career options for graduate students and younger faculty members in pushing the academy to rethink the very institutional and professional structures that have evolved and come to define the university over the past century of academic life. DH has also helped generate and valorize a whole new set of job possibilities within the academy. What Bethany Navisky of the University of Virginia's Scholarly Commission Communications Institute in 2010, dubbed ALT-AC, A-L-T hyphen A-C, or, quote, unconventional or alternative careers for people with academic training, unquote. ALT-AC has been, become something of a movement inside the academy um, and inside of DH in the past few years with its own well-articulated ideology and online publication. Uh, this is the which also uses Media Commons, by the way, the same software that, that, that uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick and NYU Press use. So it's a, very much a blogging software that encourages interaction and response. In explaining her motivation for coming, for coining the original ALDAC phrase to launch the movement, Novisky said she saw this as, quote, a pointed pushback against the predominant phrase non-academic careers. Non-academic was the label for anything off the straight and narrow path of tenure, unquote. Alt-ackers are often found in university research centers and university libraries working in a range of full-time non-teaching positions within higher education where they help develop and implement a range of digital technologies in academic teaching and in academic research. Alt-ackers can also be found outside of the of, um, the university in museums, government agencies, historical societies, and journalism. <coughs> in a very real sense, all that positions help broaden the possibilities of gainful and fulfilling employment for PhDs beyond the traditional framework of tenure-track academic jobs. To underscore these alternative possibilities and how they can play out, I'm going to engage in some personal and professional metacognition, as we say in the ad biz, and spend a few moments sketching my own trajectory as a historian who now thinks of himself at least some of the time as a digital humanist, or more accurately, a premature digital humanist, a somewhat forced bit of irony I used in my article in Matt Gold's collection. I'll explain what a premature digital humanist is for any of you who don't know the historical reference. To help understand how I find, found my way into DH at this late stage in my academic life, I do this not because my now nearly four decades long career in the academy is so emblematic, it isn't at all, but rather as a way of underscoring another basic point that I want to make about DH. There are many intellectual, pedagogical, and professional roads that lead into and out of this nascent scholarly field. I was trained as a labor historian at UCLA in the early 1970s. It's interesting for me now to realize that my first scholarly article was published when I was still a graduate student way back in 1977 in the Journal of Interdisciplinary History actually used digital technology in the form of an old-fashioned uh, of old-fashioned computer punch cards and a very large mainframe IBM 360 computer at the UCLA computing computing center to analyze strike activity by coal miners in the United States in the late 19th century based on a data set developed and published in that era by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. The IBM 360's ability to quickly crunch a set of complicated statistics quickly then meant I had to wait overnight to pick up my computer printouts. Using the then brand new program Statistical Package for the Social Sciences, the now venerable SPSS, allowed me and my co-author John Amston to ask new questions about workers' behaviors and beliefs that used correlation and regression analysis to develop new insights and uncover historical trends that would have been quite difficult to see using conventional historical methods, very akin to the kind of thing that Reddy was talking about. 
By the time the coal strike article appeared in print, I had already made the decision to leave graduate school and move to New York to accept a job in public television, researching and making historical films, where, by the way, I met Leon Fink and Sue Levine, UIC's own uh, uh, faculty members. I re reasoned at that point in my then quite young academic career that while it was still possible for me to secure a traditional academic job as a history professor, I was in fact offered such a position in Notre Dame, I decided I wanted to do public history in non-academic ways. Little did I realize at that time that I was founding the family business, as my daughter likes to describe it. <laughs> and that filmmaking gave me a better chance to present the past to broader public audiences than would a traditional academic position. I guess this makes me a premature alt-hacker as well. Parenthetically, I would note that the now three decades old public history movement was an effort by then largely young scholars similar to what DHs, DHers are doing today, to reimagine what it meant to do history for a wider public audience, moving history beyond the narrow confines of traditional scholarship to encompass non-print formats and presentational styles that would broaden history's impact on the general public. Besides learning how to make history films in New York in the late 1970s, I also had the great good fortune to meet Herbert Dutman, the distinguished labor and social historian, who did so much to reshape our thinking about how U.S. history should be written, taught, and presented to the public. As you've heard, Herb and I founded the American Social History Project at the City University in 1981. I'll just show the rather um, large and, and complicated ASHP website if you're interested in finding out. To design and create books, films, videos, and after 1992, a variety of digital media to put Americans working people, America, um, American working people's experience at the center of the U.S. historical narrative. Among the project's most important accomplishments was the publication of its Who Built America multimedia history curriculum that included a two-volume college textbook and ten history documentaries on video, still a cutting-edge educational technology in the 1980s and 90s when we conceived and produced them. The WBA multimedia curriculum also included the nation's first fully digital publication on U.S. history, the award-winning CD-ROM, Who Built America? from the centennial celebration of 1876 to the Great War of 1914. Conceived and developed by the late Roy Rosenzweig, Josh Brown, and me, and published commercially by the Voyager Company in 1993. The first WBA CD-ROM was followed eight years later by a second CD-ROM, uh, covering the years from 1914 to 1946. To underscore my earlier point that there are multiple pathways leading to the emergence of DH, we were developing these pioneering digital interventions in history at ASHP at the exact same time and very much in parallel with the efforts of John Unsworth, Jerome McGann, and their University of Virginia colleagues who were pioneering the digital textual analysis tools that I talked about earlier that proved so essential to the launch of DH a decade later. And while Roy, Josh, and I hadn't self-identified at this point as DHers the way Unsworth and his colleague did, colleagues did, what we did from that point forward, professionally and academically, was situate ourselves inside a broader digital public history movement, which had distinct resonances with more traditional DH work being done inside university English departments. Roy Rosenzweig, um, for example, went on in 1994 to found um, the Center for History and New Media at George Mason University, which remains 20 years later one of the most important DH labs and centers in the country, which he headed until his untimely death in 2007. In addition to CHNM's continued collaborative work with ASHP, which included the development of the September 11th Digital Archive, which I'll say more about in a minute, uh, CHM has also developed two path-breaking software programs, Zotero and Omeka, which you can find out about on their website, both of which have become standard applications used in numerous DH projects. I recommend both of them highly to you. Um, to turn back to, D uh, to ASHP for a moment and to frame it within the emergent DH movement, one of the hallmarks of the WBA multimedia curriculum that Roy, Josh, and I helped create, and all of ASHP's digital history work in general that followed, has been the project's quarter-century-long quarter 
commitment to using digital technologies to enhance the quality of teaching and learning of history at the high school and undergraduate levels. The two uh, Who Built America CD-ROMs and other projects that ASHP delivered, uh, developed after 1995, including um, the History Matters website, um, uh, History Matters, the U.S. survey course on the web, um, which we did in collaboration with CH&M that makes a range of primary and secondary historical materials available to teachers and students, are built on the belief that digital technologies can and should be used to improve the teaching and learning of history. This commitment to di digital pedagogy uses a wide array of textual, visual, sound, and moving image source materials that were previously inaccessible to those who might best benefit from such access in order to make history more immediate and multi-dimensional to students. We employed these multimedia resources to, do, to drive, quote, inquiry-based learning using primary sources, unquote, to employ Randy Bass's concise formulation. Working closely and collaboratively with teachers um, across the country in a series of grant-supported projects, ASHP helped pioneer a series of active learning strategies to improve history teaching, emphasizing, for example, the use of primary source documents and visual source materials to encourage students' deep immersion in historical thinking and, histor and history making. I consider ASHP's pedagogical work, which began in 1986, as much a pioneering DH effort as other academic research projects like the Whitman and Rossetti archives, which, are being, which were being developed at the same time. So too was the ASHP CHM collaboration that conceived and created the September 11 Digital Archive, which we launched in January 2002. The 9-11 Digital Archive, which we developed over the next three years, became one of the largest collections of primary materials, totaling upwards of 150,000 items related to the September 11 attacks and their aftermath solicited from ordinary citizens and participants who were affected by the events. True to our public history roots, ASHP and CHM decided early on that the archive needed to be open and accessible from the outset to the general public, rather than a hidden, fixed repository designed solely for scholars. And to assure the archive's longevity, we arranged to have it accessioned by the Library of Congress in 2003 the first fully digital archive that DLC ever accepted. The September 11 digital archive helped pioneer one of DH's most important contributions to the, to the development of public scholarship, the creation of digital archives that seek to preserve vital resources and materials related to important and impactful contemporary events, whether <coughs> natural or political. Following our example, digital archive projects have been developed over the past decade on subjects as diverse as Hurricane Katrina, the Christchurch Australia earthquake, and the Boston Marathon bombing. Actually, maybe not so diverse. I'm struck by how all of these digital archive projects that I've mentioned are about natural or human-made disasters. Must be something in that. As important as the archival intent of these projects to preserve the past, perhaps equally as important, is the ways in which their digital forms and open access allow teachers and students to engage in active teaching and learning about the larger issues and questions that these events reveal. In writing about the September 11 Digital Archive as a teaching tool, Claire Potter, who writes the widely read Tenure Radical blog in the Chronicle of Higher Education, notes that, quote, the workers, citizens, and survivors whose stories made history that clear September day have left their voices in the intriguing, emotional, and richly descriptive artifacts collected on and linked to this website. It is a particularly promising source for teaching history. The site blends the sense of discovery and ease of access that causes students to use the web as a resource in the first place with standard genres of evidence that could train those same students to use conventional archives as well, written documents, images, video, oral histories, and audio found objects, such as voicemail and spontaneous tape recordings." Unquote. Of all the positive reviews of the 9-11 Digital Archive that the archivists garnered over the years, this is the one that most pleases me, 
precisely because it speaks to the possibilities inherent in digital technology to expand the scope and very purpose of what we teach and how and to whom we teach it. Let me now turn briefly to several other digital pedagogy projects that we pioneered at CUNY that I think can help inform possible DH work at an institution like UIC. I was asked by the Graduate Center's president in the year 2000 if I would develop a new program for our graduate students who she believed needed to learn how to use digital technologies and tools in their academic teaching and research, such as the ones we had pioneered at ASHP. Working collaboratively with a group of faculty and doctoral students, I conceived and have coordinated since its founding in 2001 the Interactive Technology and Pedagogy Doctoral Certificate Program. Um, at the Graduate Center, which is an interdisciplinary certificate that provides students from a range of academic disciplines with opportunities to reflect on the broader theories behind and pedagogical implications of digital technology usage in the academy and to make sense of the growing reach of DH inside and beyond, inside the academy and beyond. The program features a strong theoretical orientation to technology's role historically in transforming the ways we work and play, hands-on instruction in and uses of a variety of digital technology tools, as well as ongoing conversations about the pedagogical implications and possibilities inherent in using digital tools to enhance the quality of teaching and learning, as well as to transform and reshape academic research and publication. Many graduate center doctoral students are employed at various CUNY campuses as instructors across the five boroughs of the city during their graduate career, careers with sole responsibility for teaching large introductory survey courses to undergraduates in their particular academic disciplines. CUNY, by the way, has a total of more than 270,000 matriculating undergraduates at our 24 campuses. The uses of digital technology to improve pedagogy is therefore of particular interest to our graduate students and to CUNY in general, as I tried to suggest in my article in Matt Rolls, Debates in the Digital Humanities Collection. Our ITP students are helping reshape the pedagogy of many CUNY undergraduate classrooms using blogs, wikis, websites, digital cameras, and other digital technologies and pedagogical strategies to engage CUNY undergraduates as more active makers of knowledge, not merely passive consumers of it. Nearly 160 doctoral students from the humanities, social sciences, and the hard sciences have enrolled in the ITP program over the past decade, um, and almost four dozen have now completed the ITP certificate requirements. The certificate is awarded when the students receive their doctorate degrees. A number of IT graduates have been able to parlay the skills they learned in digital technology and digital pedagogy along with their discipline-based doctorates to find traditional academic positions in universities and colleges around the country and internationally, as well as non-traditional digital humanities, digital pedagogy, all the positions and postdocs. A second digital um, uh, pedagogy project at CUNY, uh, looking for Whitman, um, the poetry of place in the life and work of, of Walt Whitman offers an excellent example of digital humanities pro, uh, of a digital humanities project that combines digital tools and digital pedagogy. Conceived and headed by my CUNY colleague Matt Gold, the semester-long project brought together undergraduates enrolled in four different courses at four geographically dispersed college campuses: New York City College uh, of Technology at CUNY and NYU. Um, in New York City, University of Mary Washington in Virginia, and Rutgers Camden in New Jersey to collaborate on exploring Whitman's poetry in relationship to specific places in which, in which Whitman lived and labored. The participating students and faculty members regularly shared ideas, research, and feedback about Whitman's life and writing on the project's WordPress site, which is what you're looking at here. The four-month uh, effort ended in April 2010 with a face-to-face -face generative conference held at Rutgers Camden, which not only included reports on what had been accomplished by the students on each of the four campuses during the previous fall semester, but also featured continuous, continued creation of scholarly content and student presentations about Whitman's 
life and poetry, all captured on digital video and displayed on the project's website. I think looking for Whitman as a model for how digital scholarship and digital pedagogy can be combined to enhance undergraduate teaching, as well as how social networking tools such as blogs can help bridge very real geographical, economic, and cultural gaps among and between universities and colleges. Using the somewhat breathless survey of digital production and digital pedagogy project that we've done at CUNY, um, what lessons might a large public university like the University of Illinois Chicago draw that can help move the institution's faculty and students toward doing um, DH work? I think one obvious starting point would be to concentrate UIC's institutional resources on building collaborative capacities and incorporating digital technologies and digital pedagogy into academic practice. Let me say something about each of these complementary approaches to doing DH work again, using our experiences at CUNY as guideposts for how UIC might proceed. DH work at colleges and universities necessitates a digital infrastructure where faculty and students can do DH work individually and collaboratively. This isn't merely about building a robust network digital infrastructure to handle the substantial computational requirements of many DH research projects. It is equally as much, if not more, about providing collaborative and experimental spaces for faculty and students to engage one another in ongoing discussions that encourage the virtual exchange of ideas as a necessary precursor to doing actual DH project work. One of CUNY's most successful forays into creating that kind of collaborative space has been the development of the CUNY Academic Commons, um, which this is the launch page for, an open source digital space built on the WordPress and BuddyPress platforms, which since 2009 has allowed more than 5,000 CUNY faculty members, staff, and graduate students to work together, express their opinions and enthusiasms, and occasionally to play together online. So one of my favorite sites is this one, which is the CUNY Pie site, which is for pizza aficionados who travel around New York City sampling the best pizza in the city and then blog about it and, and, and show pictures of it. Very popular site on the academic <laughs> yeah. Faculty and students, we, we don't discriminate. Um, the CUNY AC combines the best features of WordPress blogging with the relational linkages and group affordances that the BuddyPress social networking tool makes possible. Many of us, myself included, have also used the linked group and blogging software available on the Commons to develop customized hybrid teaching sites that supplement our face-to-face -face graduates with a range of asynchronous digital activities, including file sharing and blogging. I'll show you one. Uh, I only do my teaching on, on the academic comms now, fortunately. For me, access to the CUNY AC to create course websites has meant happily never, ever having to use the clunky and dreadful Blackboard CMS. <laughs> and I don't. The success of the CUNY Academic Commons as both a learning space and a social space for academic collaboration and experimentation led our Commons development team to create Commons in a Box. open source tool that we've now made available for free download on the web and that can be used to replicate in institutions large and small the academic commons we have created for the very large CUNY system. Installed on an open source LAMP server, LAMP meaning Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP, which are all sort of softwares that are open source, open source softwares, CBOX gives installation, I'm sorry, gives institutions the ability to develop collaborative workspaces, as well as sufficient blogging capacity for everyone, even in an institution the size of UIC, to embrace and employ digital social media tools. I'm proud to say that CBOX, which has already been downloaded almost 10,000 times, just received the Digital Humanity Award, uh, Humanities Award for Best DH Tool of the Year, which we are extremely proud of. We have also used the CUNY Academic Commons to launch several open source, open access scholarly journals at CUNY. I have been centrally involved in several of these digital publishing efforts. One that I am particularly proud of that I mentioned earlier is the Journal of Interactive Technology and Pedagogy. Find that for you. Um, we 
it's launched in spring 2011 and which grew out of and is based in the ITP program that I described earlier. Um, JITP is an interdisciplinary academic journal developed by editor an editorial collective of faculty, staff, and doctoral students that illustrates the possibilities and advantages of using digital tools to rethink the nature of academic research and publication. Our editorial focus is on uh, the broad connections between digital technologies and academic teaching and research. The creation of JITP has allowed my colleagues and me to conceive, solicit article for articles for review and finally published completely online a total of four issues to date in a much shorter time frame and with the expenditure of a very small amount of out-of-pocket funds, not counting, of course, our extraordinary self-exploitation as unpaid editors, designers, and site administrators. In addition to traditional long-form articles, which you can see here on the right side, these are the long-form articles. most of which include a variety of multimedia elements. JITP also has several short form sections, which you can see along the top here, um, including assignments, tool tips, book reviews, and teaching fails, which allow the journal to publish on a rolling basis relevant pieces about teaching and curricula as they are developed, rather than having to wait for the publication of the, the next formal issue. Because these short sections are structured as blogs, they are designed to encourage readers to respond immediately with comments, queries, and criticisms of the short submissions as soon as they appear online. We fully expect authors of short and long form um, pieces to rapidly respond to blog inquiries and suggestions in turn, thus encouraging the kind of critical intellectual exchange that the traditional letter to the editor format used by most print journals never quite manages to realize. Using similar digital tools as we did at JITP, I would imagine a group of energetic UIC faculty members and graduate students launching one or more online open access scholarly journals devoted to whatever are the compelling intellectual, academic, and or political issues that motivate and engage your community. Because the entire editorial and production processes are controlled and executed locally by faculty and graduate students with minimal infrastructural support from the central administration beyond the provision and maintenance of server space, there is room for a great deal of collaboration, experimentation, and capacity building. I would think that at least some current UIC graduate students and even undergraduates, like our graduate students at CUNY, already possess strong digital skills that they can bring to bear on a DH project like producing and publishing an online academic journal. Another digital pro uh, pedagogy project that we have recently undertaken at the Graduate Center may also be useful for UIC to consider. Matt Gold and I have just finished team teaching the first half of a two semester long introductory course um, entitled Digital Praxis. which we designed to give first-year graduate students at the Graduate Center a deep immersion in the varieties and possibility of digital uh, technologies and the digital humanities in order to get them thinking about digital tools and digital methodologies at the very outset of their academic uh, careers. We frequently brought in fairly high-level DH practitioners in the recently completed fall semester to speak to the digital praxis class about their ongoing DH work and then have those uh, speakers conduct workshops on how graduate students might adapt and extend digital methodologies and tools as they matriculated through their master's and doctoral programs. The seminar yielded a series of student-generated proposals for possible DH research and or pedagogy projects using the NEH Digital Humanities Office's startup grant program as a proposal template. The second semester of the Digital Praxis course, which just began earlier this month, will put students together in teams of four or five to actually begin the process of planning and building out specific DH projects that they agree in common have the potential to make significant contributions to the field. Perhaps UIC might consider developing a similar introductory course for new humanities graduate students taken at the outset of their academic careers to 
to encourage their interest in learning how to employ digital tools for a range of academic purposes. This early immersion in the, immersion in the digital can also make students <coughs> comfortable with the idea of using what they've learned about digital technologies to generate funding proposals. And NEHDH Startup Grants are a great place to start that can help them advance their academic careers and enhance the profile of their academic institutions as well. Finally, UIC faculty can also learn a lot from following the work of the CUNY Games Group, which is driven forward largely by younger community college faculty members at CUNY. Um, who are trying hard to integrate gaming concepts into their admit admittedly staggeringly heavy undergraduate teaching workloads. They teach uh, uh, a nine course workload, five and four, which is breathtakingly awful. Um, and in any case, both to enliven their classroom practice and to engage their students' interest in learning. The CUNY Games Group, which uses the CUNY Academic Commons extensively, recently held a CUNY Games Festival which drew more than 200 participants from across the country to a full day of discussions and demonstrations of how gaming can be incorporated into active learning pedagogy. Since I'm into recommending books for you to read, another one that I'd suggest is James Gee's What Video Games Have to Teach Us About Learning and Literature, or Learning and Literacy, uh, published by Palgrave in 2007, in which this cultural linguist develops a series of three dozen learning principles drawn from video gameplay that teachers can adapt to their classroom practice. He's not saying use video games in classrooms. He's saying understand the pedagogy that goes into the users learning how to play a video game and, and apply those lessons to a classroom environment. It's a very interesting and, and powerful book. All of these digital pedagogy projects are squarely situated in the scholarship of teaching and learning, a fairly recent concept and movement. It even has its own scholarly journal, the Journal of Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, published at Indiana University, that makes the case that faculty should treat and even privilege what they do in the classroom as a scholarly enterprise on a par with their scholarly research and publication work. While I once called digital pedagogy the ugly stepchild of digital humanities, perhaps digital pedagogy has finally shed that identity as more and more respected DHers engage the possibilities of digital technology um, to improve teaching and learning. So whichever direction or directions UIC decides to move in with respect to digital humanities work, whether deeper engagement with faculty research projects or toward the dig digital pedagogy and collaborative interdisciplinary undertakings that I've described at CUNY, my final thoughts are about teaching and learning and are drawn from Randy Bass, the founder of the Center for New Designs in Learning and Scholarship at Georgetown University. Candles, it's called Candles. Um, from his path-breaking 1997 introductory essay to Engines of Inquiry, when considering the adoption of new digital pedagogies or digital scholarship, don't be seduced, Bass tells us, by what he calls the rhetoric of the technological sublime, the idea that choosing the right technology automatically solves all teaching and learning problems. Instead, Bass suggests that if we want to use technology in our classrooms, we need to step back and ask three fundamental questions. What am I doing now that I'd like to do better? What pedagogical problems would I like to solve? What do I wish students did more often or differently? And if the answers to these questions lead you to decide to employ technology in your classroom, then I would offer three possible approaches to doing digital pedagogy, again drawn from Bass, that fit your particular pedagogical needs and, and desired ends. One, inquiry-based learning. Two, bridging reading and writing through online interaction. And three, making student work publish, uh, public in new media formats. Let me say those again, inquiry-based learning bridging reading and writing through online interaction, and making student work public in new media formats. I think the last one is particularly important. We have a tendency to assign papers to students, and as faculty members, we're the only ones who read them. There's very little feedback, and that depends entirely on our willingness to give feedback to students. I've seen many students, even at the graduate level, get letter grades on their papers without a word of comment. 
That's bad enough, but the other thing that needs to happen, I would argue, is students need to engage one another's work so that they can valorize it and understand it. And showing students each other's work and getting them to comment is an important pedagogical device, it seems to me. Whichever of these three or any others you might imagine you decide to adopt, I would add Bass's final caution. If you are new to using digital technology in your teaching, do one tech innovation at a time and do it well, rather than trying to do three or even five tech things all at once and succeeding in each of those at best only marginally. The process of undertaking digital scholarship and or implementing dig digital pedagogies is more like running a marathon than a sprint. Take your time, plan carefully, choose your first project well, build it collaboratively, be metacognitive in your approach uh, to your own teaching, so be thinking about exactly what you're doing while you're doing it, and be prepared, as we tell our ITP students every year, to fail. But make sure that when you do experience the inevitable setbacks in incorporating technology into your scholarly and or pedagogical practice, that you fail forward, as we like to say, that you learn from your mistakes and you try again. Good luck. Happy to take questions or criticisms or responses or anything anybody wants to ask or add. How much server space for an online journal? Uh, not, not, not that much. I mean, a relatively small amount of space. Nothing that's going to make your IT people roll their eyes. I mean, it's more than a PDF file because you include multimedia and such. But we, we hardly ever think about it. It's, you know, it's in the megabytes, you know, hundreds of megabytes, sometimes occasionally a gigabyte or two, but it's nothing that current technology is, is not going to be able to handle. Um, so I, I think the big question is, where do you find server capability? The problem with most IT operations, I used to be the vice president for IT at the CUNY Graduate Center, so I know this from the inside. Um, the big problem is an unwillingness in a lot of IT departments to use open source software. Not because they're really worried about it, but they don't like the idea that they can't control it through typical means like a Microsoft IIS server. And, and that's a huge issue, and I don't minimize it, but there are ways around that. Uh, they can start using the WordPress server at publish.es.edu. It's just rolled out. Uh, my question would be whether you can use CBOX to roll CBOX into that if someone was interested. Well, that's an interesting question. We've started to talk about using CBOX in that way and sponsor. This is something that CHM does you know, with its Zotero and Omeka sites. Can you just explain a little bit what that means? Well, so the issue is where do you where do where do you get server space? Where does your your site live? And, and ideally, what you, I would argue you don't want it on a WordPress.com site. You don't want to use the, it's it's free to be sure, but you need to control what you do inside your own institution. Ideally, if you can, and so my first line of approach would be to talk to the IT people and say, can you do an open source server, the LAMP server that I described. This is, uh, what I'm saying is we have that right now. You have it. We have it. So then all I would say to you, I didn't understand your question. All I would say to you is CBOX is available for you for free. You can install it. And the beauty of CBOX, comments in a box, the software I talked about, is that there's a very rich and growing, because there have been 10,000 downloads, a growing community of people. You have a problem or a question using CBOX, you post to the CBOX blog, you're going to hear 20 responses very, very quickly. Plus, we have arguably one of the two or three best programmers in the country working on WordPress and BuddyPress. Boone Gorgas is our, our website uh, you know, lead developer. He can respond to any of these things. So we are very much in support of the idea of CBOX rolling out in a variety of places. One of the first places that adopted it was the MLA. It's the largest uh, you know, professional organization in the country. They're using it to roll out what they call MLA Commons. And what they want to use it for is building a social network. Um, that, and, and that's exactly what CBOX does that a WordPress.com site cannot do. Because that's only going to give you blogging. 
what, what, what CBOX does is it gives you the social networking software that goes along with you. You can create groups. You can have, that's the CUNY, I gave you the CUNY Pi one, just as a whimsical example. You can create groups very easily on, um, on the Academic Commons or on CBOX. And that's the, one of the most important things that has helped to build the organization. It takes, frankly, it takes the power to use technology away from the central administration and returns it to the faculty and the students. That's why we've had an interesting fight at CUNY over who's going to control this and so far. We're winning that battle and I can tell you our central CUNY CIS operation is convinced that we have this much control and power. They hate this thing and, and I take it that is a very good sign that we're doing the right thing. Well, it, it's also, I, I'm speaking from the, the, the computer side, but if people would like to start using the WordPress site, the, the I, ITL would be very happy to help them out. There you go. Uh, the question, I will, I will research to find out if we can roll CBOX into our existing structure. I think you probably can. We without probably much can, but I, I don't know for sure, so I'm not going to promise that. But I'd be happy to help anybody out Excellent. to set up anything like that here. That's a good idea. Nice, nice, uh, thank you. Thank you. I just. Oh no, go ahead. I'm sorry, you went back. Yeah, I just wanted to say that the library already has uh, an open source journal publishing software program. Right. If anyone is interested in starting up their own journal, um, we already have something set and ready to go. Are there have there been any takers yet? Oh sure, we have five journals. Uh, well, actually, more than five in there now. And two of them are actually also um, archived in PubMed Central. They're medical ones, but there's uh, uh, at least one humanities one in there, some social sciences. Um, so we're definitely interested in, in uh, getting more journals published in there. So. Holly Thistlewaite, who is our chief librarian at the CUNY Graduate Center, has totally remade our library and our library staff. And it's, it's completely gone toward the digital. And she's got a number of digital service librarians who work with faculty and graduate students. So our pathway has been made a lot easier by a library that, as it sounds like you're doing, has started to understand that things need to change in a fundamental way. And that online academic publications, scholarly journals, is going to be a wave of the future. Howard? Yeah, so I thought it was a wonderful talk. And I can tell how wonderful it was because it made me feel very guilty about all the things I do badly now. <laughs> Uh, that wasn't my intention. <laughs> um, so at the AGI, I was talking with somebody who does a lot of digital uh, pedagogy at George Mason, uh -huh. which I consider the SACA. And he said that actually most of his colleagues in his new department disdain him. <laughs> and I was really surprised. So I'm wondering if you feel like it's not just the administration that's the enemy, but your colleagues as well are not fully on board. And how, if so, how do you respond to that? You know, as my Aunt Gogo used to say, some people you can't be nice to. You try your best, and, 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 and at some level you can't make it happen. And, and so I, I think, I, I don't want to be, um, you know, too dismissive of that. There are some faculty who will never get this and never understand it. I, I've made my decision at the end of my career. I'm going to be doing this for a few more years, but not forever. I've made my decision I'm going to throw in with younger faculty across the CUNY system and with graduate students because I feel like there are senior faculty who can be convinced of this and there are people I try to work with, but mostly when they don't, it's like spitting in the wind. I mean, I, you can't, you're not, going to, you're not going to convince people to change that easily. So I'm not saying dismiss them, but try to do what you can to find colleagues and comrades who you can do the work with. So what I do, my job now, as I see it in teaching my ITP program, I have the good fortune of being able to team teach the courses I offer to doctoral students. I always work with a young colleague, particularly from the community colleges, with this horrendous workload that they have. Giving them a course release to come and teach doctoral students is like a, a pleasure for them. So I've been working with a lot of younger faculty, and my job is to sort of get the next generation of people ready to do this. So I pass the torch and they it's, it's a long struggle. This is not going to be won automatically. And I think there are a lot of people who are going to disdain digital technology moving forward because they, they see it as undermining something sort of fundamental about what the university is. I'm willing to have the argument, but at a certain point, if you can't convince them, you can't convince them. Lisa. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, you want some criticism. <laughs> Anything you want, you know. But, uh, no, it seems to me that there's a big continuum in the rich uh, range of uh, projects that you lay out from the, I would say, maybe one end to one of the ones, last ones you mentioned was uh, undergraduates who effectively are disseminating their work to other students, uh, which seems like a wonderful idea. I wonder if you didn't say anything about that how that's uh, worked out in practice, but I, I, I think that would, I, I could immediately see it's... Uh, You're talking advantage. about the Whitman project that I talked about. Um, yeah, and you said that um, effectively to have undergraduates who break down just this um, uh, silence that happens with undergraduate papers, right. or even graduate, graduate papers, papers. Or that, yeah. either one, but um, to have a wider uh, circulation uh, I wonder if you could comment on, you know, excited examples of how that has worked in practice. But, yeah. but say that, to me, is that kind of one end, um, that's sort of the common end, end of the spectrum. Um, and then at the very beginning of the talk, you were talking about uh, these two or three books that have um, used uh, more uh, spots, uh, Simultaneous uh, commentary, kind of blogging, mm -hmm. critique, Immediate ed ed editorial, uh, you know, much more uh, group editorial process. Um, and at that end, let me just ask you about that end for a second, yeah. because, um, you know, that uh, for these particular projects, I definitely see how the uh, 50 comments or uh, by people interested in the field, how that would enrich the project. But, um, you know, as the editor of a journal myself, uh, one of the tough decisions is to decide what doesn't make the cut. Sure. Um, how do you make that decision when you're opening it up to uh, everybody in the field to comment simultaneously? How do you deliver the bad news, if there's going to be any bad news, or does everything just go out then with, in an undifferentiated way? That's a great question and a, and a totally fair one. I, I can say a little bit about how Kathleen's book worked because I know that story well. There are a couple of other books that have been have used similar media commons uh, blogging software to do it. I think in, in each of the, those instances, the presses have made a basic commitment to publish the book. And what the author said was, in addition to the standard double-blind peer review that you're going to send it out for, I would like to do this as an experiment. That's what Kathleen did with her book. And so it wasn't thrown open to the world. It, it went through the same double-blind peer review that, 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 that a traditional NYU press publication would get. But it, it had, in addition, this other sort of level of review. And, and it was an experiment precisely because they wanted to see what was the quality of the interaction and what did she learn more from. And by consensus, she got more from the Media Commons review by 50 people who she could engage with directly while it was happening than she got from the, the, the Double Blind Peer Review. The book was obviously published. And, and would it have been as good a book without that Media Commons thing? I think probably not. I think if she'd left it, because she herself said, the, the amount of editing and, and revision she did in response to what she got online was, was, was substantial. And she felt the book was very much strengthened, and so did the, her editor at, at, at my press. It's one, it's one experiment. It doesn't prove that this is the way to go. It's, I think what I'm interested in doing, what she's interested in doing, is helping us rethink the standard review model. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have mistakes or that you wouldn't run into those kind of problems. So let me explain to you what we do on JITP. Every, every review is open. We send it out to a group of outside reviewers, two reviewers outside the editorial collective, and we get a response from those two reviewers in the field. If both are negative and the, and the, and the people from the editorial collective in charge of that issue think that, it, it, that they shouldn't move forward, we tell the people it's either rejected or they're going to have to revise and resubmit it. If they basically get positive reviews but they need revisions, we then send to people inside the collective and the collective responds to it. And the goal here is always to sort of try to work with the submitters to get them to improve their pieces. So one of the things that we've instituted, um, I'll, I'll show you this uh, here, 
we did um, uh, what we call behind the scenes, which is a, an effort, let me get to issue three, So this was an article that a colleague um, at, at the LaGuardia Community College did um, on academic review and, and advanced to, advancement, to candidacy, uh, advancement to tenure based, he's in, he's in media studies and production. And what we've done with behind the scenes is open up the review process. And we've said what we're, we're going to do, in this case we did a video with him. The editors of the piece sat down and we said, let's go talk through what the review process was like for you. What did you think of the first stage of review? What did you think of the second stage? And we had this honest exchange and, and conversation. And the goal here is very much to demystify the review process. Because for most graduate students and, and young faculty, they're not fully cognizant of how that process works in most instances. This is a way to demystify and open up that process. And we are going to institute this every issue of the review. We're going to do a behind the scenes. On, on one key article where we get the author's permission to say we're going to review this thing. So I think, does this solve the problem? Do, do, we, do, we, get, do we reject articles in Giant TV? Absolutely. But when we're willing to work with an author and we put them through some significant paces editorially, we want to show what, what, what's involved in that process. I, I encourage you to take a look at these. I, I can't show it to you now. But there's one for uh, uh, issue three and one for issue four as well. Yes? So does that mean that um, either you're rejected and nothing will happen, or you're um, accepted by the blind review and then you go into this open review process? Because yeah. I think your question was partly like, what about people, if the, if the, review, if the review process is open to the public just in general, what happens to those No, ours are not open to the public. public. I don't want to confuse oh, okay. these two things. I, I'm sorry if that I gave that impression. Our, we have not yet used the media commons we're trying to establish the journal, and we're in a brand new field, and that's part of the issue, is we're trying to define a field as it's like flying a plane while you're building it. So we haven't done a media commons, I think. We have plans to do that in the future. We're going to try to do, on a limited basis, an open peer review to see what it works like. And probably what will happen will be one of the members of the editorial collective who's willing to step up and, and subject themselves to that kind of review process with no guarantees. In other words, the editorial collective maintains the final word, but it's a collective the way when I came up with this idea from my work on Radical History Review way back in the 1970s when I came to New York. We had an editorial collective, not an editorial board, and, and not a single editor, but somebody who was, you know, we had a, a collective set of responsibilities. And that's hard, and it takes more time. And there's a lot of discussion. We spend a lot of time on this thing. But we're very happy with the results, given that it's a brand new online journal. Um, yeah. I, I have one more question, too. Um, you mentioned self-exploitation and the amount of labor that, because I mean, it's not free to run online. It surely is not. And many people in this room um, already spend that kind of effort, not, not necessarily on, on the open uh, journal, right. access journals, but I mean, it's something we do in addition to sort of the work that we're, that's visual, right. you know, that's very visible. Um, and I was thinking, um, I'm from the University of Bergen, I'm visiting this semester, and our university, and I think several other universities have just started this, um, they give funding for open access so you can pay a company or you know, a publisher or a journal so that your article or your book will be open access. So our university just started, um, they advertise now this funding to apply for that. And I think more institutions are starting to do that, which is a sort of a different model. A way different model. It is. And open and access by itself does not mean that it's going to be any less exploitative in, in, a, in a business model. There are lots of business models out there now which are tricking themselves out as open access and soliciting stuff and then telling people, if you pay, we will publish your article. It's, it, you know, it's, it's a kind of, it, it's everything we don't like um, about publishing in general, it's made worse by that environment, which is why my argument is faculty and, and students need to process. And if you can keep it in-house, you have a much better chance. How you avoid the self-exploitation, I have no idea. <laughs> I self-exploited when I worked on Radical History Review, and I'm self-exploiting 40 years later working on Journal of Interactive Technology and Pedagogy. I think that's just the nature of academic and, and intellectual work. But at least you're not left 
in, you know, to the vagaries of, of, of some sort of business model where the people who control the actual publishing and distribution outlet um, really have the final say. We don't have any publication costs beyond setting up the server. And that's the good news. Plus, we can do everything multimedia. It, there's no problem or issue putting video, audio, uh, uh, visuals, text, whatever. Um, in, in any article, and we encourage that. We're telling our um, so, you know, people we solicit articles from, be as freewheeling and, and open about what you want to include in your piece. The more multimedia from our perspective, the better, because we want to be able to use you know, the power of the web in, in, in this way. That's the power of web publication. You're not, not only not using dead trees and having to put it through the mail, you're also sort of opening up the possibility and that's, you know, my whole career has been devoted to that, so I'm really thrilled to be at this point. You know, I did it, you know, with uh, CD-ROMs for a long time because I thought that was what was going to be the, the, the change agent, and then the web came along in 95 and everything changed. Do you think we should do the same thing for monographs? I know, like, there's, there's Open Humanities Press, which does online yeah. multi-models. Yeah. Um, I just did a review for their book on, I did a review for them on a book called Interestingly, digital, digital pedagogy, and, and, and it was very much available completely online instantly. I don't know, maybe. I mean, I think what we need to be is a little experimental. We need to try different things. The problem is, you know, the pressure on young faculty is to have a standard monograph published, you know, between two, two covers, um, you know, in, in, in a traditional model. That is not a sustainable model given the economy and given how, how tight academic library budgets are. It, you know, back in the day when I was a graduate student, you just needed to publish your book, and the guarantee was three to 500 libraries would buy the hardcover edition. That paid for the publication. It was the simplest thing in the world to run an academic press. That's over. I mean, that is just not happening anymore. And because the number of academic publications has grown, what do we do? The, the funnel is getting tighter and tighter. This is one alternative, but what this takes is a commitment on the part of senior faculty to accept that this is as digitally, this is as academically rig rigorous as traditional publications. I would say it is. I would argue that any of the things we publish in this journal is as rigorously reviewed and edited as anything that can be done through a conventional print publication. I'll leave that to other people to see if they think I'm right, but I really do believe that that's the case. So if we can do that, then I think we've got a, a, another possibility. Which leads to the obvious question, how successful have you been in changing mindsets at CUNY's Graduate Center for p and Well, one of my jobs as the Senior Academic Technology Officer for the Graduate Center is um, I am the advocate for doctoral students who are interested in incorporating digital technology into their final dissertations. Are we at the point where a fully digital dissertation has been accepted? No. But what I'm increasingly finding is people are coming to me from a range of academic programs and departments. They're faculty members and the students saying, what can I do to add a digital piece to my dissertation? And the reality is the library's been wonderful, and even ProQuest has been wonderful. Neither the library nor ProQuest has any limitations on the format for dissertations that they will accept. We think that it has to be PDF or nothing. That's not the case. I mean, there's a negotiation to be had with both the library and ProQuest when you want to do something unusual digitally, but it's entirely possible to do that. So one of my jobs at the Graduate Center is to make that happen. We're starting to turn that around, but it takes a long time to convince faculty. My administration is much more prone to do this than a lot of the faculty who sit on you know, doctoral dissertation committees. So I'm often asked, I'm on a, a diverse number of PhD dissertation committees in part because I'm the one person at the Graduate Center who can understand the digital aspects that a lot of students are using in sociology, in urban education, in linguistics. I just sat on the linguistics one where the, the chair had no clue what the student was talking about because she was doing stuff related to um, Twitter and using Twitter as a research source. So, I think it's, it's a process, and I think what we, we're going to try to do is provide some examples of how um, academic scholarship can be transformed, but there's no magic bullet in this, no simple way to make it happen. It's starting to change. It's starting to change in CUNY, but, but, 
but not quickly. Um, no, sorry. Uh, so question. But um, I'm a graduate student in history, and so I'm kind of thinking of a few years out, I want to be sort of better at, at digital humanities, and um, both as a public historian and, and for teaching purposes. Um, but I've always been sort of daunted, like, like it's, um, it's, it's daunting how much, I'm not very tech savvy. Mm -hmm. um, so how much do I need to be sort of learning another language to engage with this, these, all these tools? Um, do I need to be taking some classes, or should I, are there books you recommend that are kind of building up to this higher I recommend I will be sending, whoever, whoever attends this will get a list of the web links and the books that I mentioned, and the books that I mentioned could be helpful to you in that regard. I would say this, there's a big debate in DH whether you need to be a programmer in order to be a dh -er. I fall very heavily on the side that says no. I don't think you need to learn program language to be a dh -er. I think what you need to have is a different orientation to what history scholarship is. And one of the things you should look for, I don't know if you attend the AHA or the OAH conferences, but if you do, there are increasing numbers of sessions, both inside the conference and outside the conference, immediately proximate to it, where you can take workshops, short workshops, on DH. The Center for History and New Media runs a that camp. I don't know if you've heard of that camp. You might want to take a look for that THAT. Um, humanity, I can't remember what the acronym of THAT stands for but I think it's humanities and technology. And what it's really about is a, a, an opportunity for you to go in an environment where you would say, here's what I'd like to learn. Are there other people who feel the same way? And then the, the unconference gets organized around that. So look for those and look for sessions at the, at the OAH and the AHA. Um, and the other thing I would say is if you, if you get the Chronicle of Higher Education, follow the, the Wired uh, uh, you know, blog that they blogs that they have. There are many people, I mentioned one, Claire Potter's tenured radical, she's a historian. There are a lot of people who blog regularly on this subject. Start to get familiar with it. You can also, I don't know if you use Twitter, but I would recommend Twitter as a way to kind of, if you follow the right people, you can get a fairly regular Twitter stream on digital humanities. There are a number of people who, who you can follow, some of whom I mentioned in my talk today. Uh, the other resource we have is Linda.com. It's free for everyone, and if you go out to uh, go.uic.edu slash Linda with a Y, and look up Twitter, uh, WordPress, blogs, uh, you'll get a, uh, a wide selection of really short videos, and if you like watching videos, it's a way to uh, uh, understand things, you don't have to be a programmer at all, I can partner with you. Uh, this will give you a step-by-step -step introduction to that, and you can apply those things to instances where you might have uh, in class. One of the reasons I talked about the digital praxis class that I mentioned that Matt Golden and I taught is I thought it would be something that your colleagues, faculty colleagues here might think about doing some version of. It seems to me there's probably enough skill in, 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 in this area, in, in this university, to be able to organize, if not, the, well, ours is fairly ambitious, it's a first year, two semester course for entering students. But you could do something, and I would think this would be an opportunity for you to recruit people like this to, to, to this effort. Yes? Did you offer that to all graduate students? Say again? Did you offer it to all new students? I mean, no, 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 only the graduate center. Oh, okay. Only the graduate center. No, no. But that would be <laughs> could, awesome. No, no. That's awesome. why the Academic Commons is not, what, you, you may have noticed I didn't say undergraduates uh, because we could not possibly deal with 270,000 undergraduates. We're a, we're, to say we're a mom and pop shop is barely accurate. It's a small boutique -y operation. So at the moment we can handle 5,000. We could probably handle 10,000. We certainly could not handle 270,000. So my instinct, at least what we did with digital practice, was to limit it to the graduate students. We had in that first class about 40 students who signed up for it. It wasn't a requirement. We, we, we made it available and masters and and PhD students took it and have, have committed to a, a whole year. Um, a lot of programs will dissuade them from doing that or not even give them the flexibility to take a course like that. Yeah. But, uh, so I was, in, in Norway, I was on this um, national uh, committee um, trying to figure out why Norway, basically why Norway didn't invest foreign sites. Norway, Norway isn't quite up there. 
with inventing new cool tech things. So they support, they have this national committee, and um, one of the chapter I thought was most interesting was we were asked to think about like digital competency in the population, which it's just, I, and I think it's probably the same almost everywhere. Kids don't learn programming in school. Kids don't learn. Kids learn to use. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the same thing. We learn, we teach our kids to use technology to make PowerPoint presentations and Excel. They can figure out how many kids like in their life with Excel, but they're not really learning, you know, what to do with it beyond that. So we're teaching them to be consumers, and that's something I actually really deeply think that we should be teaching our students in universities. It's really hard to get your brain around how to get that there because although there are um, some people with, you know, great ideas and skills, but there's not enough of us to teach all the other grads, and we should be actually. Yeah, I, Is that something you think? No, I think it's a very it's a very good point. I think you know digital literacy is a really important subject for undergraduates to understand. They may be fossil using particular technologies, but they don't necessarily have a clear sense of exactly what the web is or how it works. One of the things I'm noticing with students who graduate from our ITP program with a PhD in an academic discipline and the ITP certificate is they're often hired for in this case, even for tenure track jobs, to be the sort of young scholar, the young new scholar in their department that's going to help the department think about those those kind of approaches in new and innovative ways and help. So I've had a couple of students who've already started new positions, one at SUNY New Paltz, who was in effect told by her department chair as part of her first year assignment, you have to help us think differently and better about how to use digital technology and how to teach digital literacy to our students. And I think that's more and more going to be the case as my generation ages out and there, there's a kind of turnover in the faculty, although that's a slower process. Um, I, I'd love to tell this anecdote. When I went to my provost and said at one point I was thinking of retiring, he said to me, you can't retire. And I said, well, respectfully, you control a lot of my life, but you can't tell me when I can retire. He said, well, you can't retire because if you retire, I'm 68. So I'm saying I would retire at 70. He said, the average age of our faculty goes up. <laughs> we have people in their 80s in the graduate center still teaching. So, you know, it's all relevant. <laughs> How long do people teach is an interesting question. It was the same thing that Leon and I faced when we were young scholars. It was, when was this generation of old farts going to finally hang it up? And a lot of them didn't hang it up for a long time, you know. It, it took Forever, so uh, that's the, the university is not self-replicating in quite the, the obvious ways that it should. But I do think seriously that young scholars with this skill set can be very helpful in that process and help to lead in a very real way. Thank you, everybody. There are refreshments in the back corner. Oh. Thank you. 
I mean, you get to have the money arguing on your side. Well, you wouldn't get something else. So the problem is the problem is that the problem is that a one-off course is itself money. It's it's hard to sit. It's usually I mean, actually, those are the yeah, that would be the like businesses that do this, you know, really okay. you usually need a certificate program, some kind of degree program where you justify the time. You're going to actually go outside of the university and look for a new revenue, perhaps to try to sell it, then require you to do fast expenses compared to just sitting and waiting for these applications to for high school fees to get a chicken um, And so, in order that you can make it, you can pay very handsomely on that, but you have to. Uh, but you know, to, to do it, you really need to keep them in for more than just one course. You probably can't make your marketing costs yeah, back on a single, on a single one, so you have to commit to it. You know, you really have to, the college would really have to buy into it. I, I tried to get some sort of careers, but I don't know. Well, I can't do that. I, I do have people to give another class on yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, this as an issue you know, I don't. I'm thinking to turn that one to the movie. A what? A movie. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah I've got, I, I lined up with the, I lined up with the Canvas Network, which will allow lots of different, you know, it's basically a place to teach once if your university has yeah. yeah. hooked up with social network with edX. And so they're cool, and they're looking forward to it, but I, I must have, in order to do it, I must have uh, permission from the university, and I haven't, you know, just, I don't even, because I'm just trying to get that going. Yeah. I hope all the counselors are professional. There's a memorandum of understanding that, they, that some university official who can be a dean, who can be a provost, who can be an associate, I think, um, has to sign and get back to campus. But, so if I wanted to teach them, well, oh, maybe, I don't know. There's a committee that's supposed to be a figure of the books, and last I heard they were meeting. So uh, there may be a policy being generated somewhere. That's what that committee was supposed to do. Um, yeah, so, well, I, they, may, they may have gotten frozen in. Who's the next chancellor? What's the next chancellor want to do? So it's a little hard to tell. But, um, but that's an interesting mechanism for schools. That, that if you want to do something with a school brand, that school affiliation. I, I mean, I